complex. Well, I'd like to welcome our next speaker, Matthias Jonsson, uh, who will talk on degenerations of volume forms and Calabia All right, thank you. Uh, well, let me start by thanking the organizers for the opportunity to speak here. Um, it's good to be back in Moscow. And I think even though I won't make a very precise reference, uh, this kind of gen degenerations and asymptotic uh, analysis uh, has a lot to do with the uh, Russian school, even from here from Moscow, um, closely related to things uh, done by Varchenko, Arnold, and others. Um, anyway, so um, to the extent I say new things, it will be based on a recent preprint by Sebastian Buxam and myself. Um, but I won't get to that quite now. Well, let me just, uh, I'll try to do a kind of gentle introduction. So uh, let me just say very vaguely what I want to look at. So I want to have like a, this is supposed to be, well, it's a degeneration. So this is like a one parameter family one complex parameter family of some, some kind of variety. Um, so maybe later we'll mainly look at the case of a Calabial variety. So um, you want to think of this, well, of course, this could be like a constant family, and then there's not so much uh, to say. So somehow, but you want to study whatever this means, xt as t tends to 0. Right? So of course, this is just not so clear what is meant by that. But let me just give him one example of a, so let's look at a, which will be in a Colabial. So let's say that xt is, um, so let me sit inside two-dimensional projective space. So let me do, um, so say xyz plus t and then x cubed plus y cubed plus z cubed equal to 0 inside p2. Oops. Um, so of course this, <coughs> at least for t close to 0, this is a, well, it's an elliptic curve. Or you can think of this as a um, geometrically, whatever that means, like a torus. But it's kind of skinny torus, right? So it's Because um, you see, if you plug in t equal to 0, something's going to happen. You can actually kind of chain, I mean, essentially the torus as a Riemann surface has kind of two parameters here. Uh, and you can kind of see that it looks like this. So as t tends to 0, this xt should somehow converge to a circle, like a real one-dimensional manifold. And uh, somehow part of the objective is to try to, well, not to prove necessarily, but at least uh, to make these kind of statements precise. Right. So in what, I mean, I didn't say in what sense I want this convergence to happen. And that's exactly what I want to talk about. OK. But just in order to be a little bit precise, I'm going to spend a lot of this first lecture not really talking about degeneration so much, but just kind of setting up uh, formalism. So I'll be a little bit slow, and there will be some overlap with a previous talk by Wotsky. Okay. So I want to go back and just say wh what I mean by like algebraic projective varieties and complex manifolds. And, and so I mean, not from the very beginning, but at least make, make some uh, little bit pedantic points, perhaps. So I mean, I'll get to Calabiao in, in a while as well. But um, whatever I'm going to work are, with are kind of, so I hope this is readable. Uh, so say smooth, complex, projective varieties. Right? So what I mean, so I mean extrinsically, This I just mean that x, I have some subvariety inside some p n of c, 
So this is just cut out by a bunch of homogeneous equations in uh, m plus 1 complex variables. OK, and then I assume it's smooth, uh, which has a natural meaning. But I just want to emphasize this is just uh, there's not, nothing in particular about C. So at this level, I can just define it over any field. So this is just algebraically. And then if you want this more intrinsically, So then maybe I want, uh, well, you can do this in different ways. So maybe I think of XL. So this is, a, say, a polarized uh, variety. I mean, smooth, right? So X is some, uh, well, a priori will be projective as well. But a priori, it's not, right? So this is some kind of algebraic variety. Uh, over C, I mean, again, smooth, et cetera. And then I want L to be an ample line bundle. Okay. <coughs> and then the sections, I mean, once I have this, then I get from I, this is just taking the global sections of L embeds this into some projective, sorry, P. Uh, maybe for maybe for M. Like this, or maybe a dual if you like if you like. <coughs> okay. So that's slightly more intrinsic. Uh, and here when I talk about line bundles, I will think of line bundles sometimes as kind of geometric objects as fibering like a total space or as an invertible sheaf. Okay. So I haven't done very much. Um uh, you get some more when you study this in this generality, somehow the main hero here is the canonical bundle. Right. So, um, so basically, so just sections. If I view this, so the sections of Kx are well, holomorphic, or think of them as n forms. Right? I mean, at this point, I haven't really defined with, there's no particular meaning of holomorphic n forms. They're just kind of regular n forms. Right? And where n is OK. And then, of course, you can go on. <coughs> so there are kind of the three special cases, which were already discussed in the last talk. Um, but some properties of this canonical bundle. So, oops. So you can have, so this Kx can be ample or kind of anti ample, or it could be trivial, or it could be something else. But those are at least three interesting cases. Um, Right? So I'm going to have, so first is that kx is positive. So this means I, well, so I mean that kx is ample. So then you say that x is canonically polarized. Because kx, x comma kx is a, is a polarized uh, variety in this case. You have the opposite case. So this is like minus kx is ample. And in general, I'm going to use for line models kind of additive notation. So it's, this is like kx tensor like minus 1 or something. But let me not let me write like this. So this then x is, well, anti-canonically polarized or just phono a definition. Or then you have this Calabiao case. and. Uh, of course, so here I'm taking a somewhat, in some sense, both a restrictive and generous definition of Calabiao. So I'm just going to say this is equal to 0. So this in the sense that it's linearly equivalent, right? or maybe linearly equivalent. So it has, so Kx has kind of a global 
non-vanishing section. It's not so important, but let me just, if I, for this purpose here, say that x is then Calabi. Yeah. Right. Of course, sometimes, I mean, Calabi out can be defined in different ways. And I think the reason for the name is it's not really from this definition, but from um, the Calabi out theorem, which was already mentioned and which I'll also come to. And then sometimes you want to, you might want to exclude things like tori, and so um, you might require the, the uh, variety to be simply connected or so. Okay. Um, so let me just do a couple of simple examples. this again. Okay. So again I I, I realize for a lot of people this will be extremely elementary, but um, let me nevertheless do this. So let me take a hypersurface inside Pn, where d is the degree of one, just one homogeneous polynomial. Right? So then by a junction, you can compute the canonical class of x. So it's the, res it's the restriction of something on Pn to x. Right? Kx, if I'm just a bit careless here, this is just Kpn plus x restriction to x, and then you can figure out. So this implies that if, uh, if d is less than or equal to n, then you have something that's x is Fano, and d is n plus 1, then x is Calabi-Yau, and d is bigger than n plus 1, then x is um, canonically polarized. Of course, if you take more complicated sub-varieties that are not hypersurfaces, there's no reason why you would be in any of those three situations. Okay. Well, since I'm at it, it doesn't take long. So I guess this is so x is equal to some curve, algebraic curve of genus G. So curve is just because this algebraic dimension is 1. But of course, as a if you view it as a complex manifold, of course, it's a Riemann surface of, of um, dimension 2. So in this case, the degree of kx, well, this is 2g minus 2. So if you have that so g is 0, then this is, so then x is, um, of course, this is a Fano. So this is p1 in this case. G is 1, then X is calabi -Yau. So this is an elliptic curve. And when G is greater than or equal to 2, then X is, well, it is um, canonically polarized. Uh, it, is, it is a curve of genus at least 2. OK, so that's kind of purely algebraic. I could, there was nothing particular about complex numbers going on here. Um, but from now on, I will actually s try now to, to actually view these as complex manifolds. So I do care about the, that I have the ground field, which is C. Okay. So, Let me look at projective complex manifolds. Right. So this is, I mean, so this is just if I want to, I'm not going to be that pedantic in a little while, but in principle, so when I'm in given, if I have a extrinsically, say, smooth, uh, 
So complex, projective variety. So just something algebraically, x sitting inside Pn, right? Over well over C. Um, so then you get a complex manifold. By which I really mean, I mean, I'm not going to give the definition of a complex manifold, but it's, I mean, it's a topological space with a pretty good topology. So locally it looks like a ball in CN, and, and then transition functions are holomorphic and so on, which is something that in principle uh, you don't have here. This would be the Zariski topology or so. So, so this, if I'm pedantic, this would be like an XH, where H is for holomorphic. There's some kind of analytification of, of x, right? And, um, and of course, I mean, it's just done by you, just locally. You're given by these solutions to the polynomial equations and just by the implicit function theorem, you, you know that you're going to um, be, that defines a complex manifold. On the other hand, as long as I'm projective, so projective would just mean that it sits inside Pn, right? So x, so this guy sits inside kind of complex projective space, which again, if I stick to being a bit pedantic, this is also a complex manifold, simple one. Uh, and in fact, of course, you have Chow's, well, a version of Chow's theorem, so any any complex submanifold of, uh, of some, say, Pn, I mean, if you want like this, is I mean, algebraic. I mean, so it's projected. So it's really given by algebraic equation. OK. OK. All right, fair enough. So now, <coughs> that's just. But now, once you have a complex manifold or view such a thing as a complex manifold, then you have additional structure. So I want to spend some time talking about that. Because I need it. I want to, I may not use exactly the same notation and terminology as, as other speakers. So nothing else. I want to do that. So this is, so this is additional structure. on kx, I mean kxh. So, so now I'm just going to write this. This becomes kind of unwieldy. So, so from now on, I'm actually going to identify just the, whole, the complex manifold with the kind of the algebraic variety itself. Uh, I don't think there will be a lot of confusion. I mean, so first of all, you have. You can talk about Hermitian metrics, in particular Kähler metrics. So I'll be a little bit sloppy here. So what I mean by Kähler metric, I really mean the Kähler form So this is going to be, a, a, say, a smooth, positive, closed. Uh, one one form on X, right? <coughs> and if you started with something, so I mean, if you are in this, if you are a projective variety, these always exist, but uh, there could be many of them, so you might have some choice. And in particular, if you, if uh, if uh, if you have a polarized. Variety, so they may you may want to require that actually this omega lies in the first churn class of L. Okay, so okay, maybe time some suitable constant, but let me not worry about that. Okay. So once you have a Kähler metric, I mean really a Kähler form, I should be maybe so this K, this induces. A Hermitian metric uh, 
on x. I mean, just a Hermitian in a form in a product on each tangent space, and then varying in some smooth way. Um, and then, if I just very roughly forget a, lo a lot of things here, then this induces I get a metric space from this. So from metric is used in different ways. Here I just mean like a distance function on, a, on x. Okay. Okay. So that's one thing. Um, now once you have line bundles, you can also talk about metrics. As I said, it's kind of an overloaded word. You can talk about metrics on line bundles. So um, here I think of a line model not just as a kind of invertible sheaf, but actually I want to think of it as, as a total space. So I can have L and then a map to X. So here is a bunch of lines, essentially. Maybe they kind of curve a little bit, but anyway. Uh, and you have the zero section. So this is X, and then above X, I have an LX, which is essentially C, except that I don't have a particular, I don't know what one is here. Right? So um, well, first of all, I'm going to use additive terminology uh, for on both line models and metrics. I'm not sure if I'm really going to use this formalism that much, but just in case um, I do, let me mention this now. So I mean, so what is a a metric is a way of measuring just lengths inside LX, or if you want, just to define what the unit disk is inside each LX. Um, but so, but here. Uh, right, so instead of, so what would be, a, so this is kind of usual maybe how you do a metric, so this is kind of a, something that's um, right, so a metric would be something that just measures how, uh, where you are, I mean how far out you are from the zero section, so, and it takes just the, the norm. Uh, so instead of using that, I'm just going to use, say, phi to be minus log of this thing. So this goes from L to, in principle, to, I guess, R union plus infinity. Or if you want, maybe L minus the zero section to R. I mean, of course, this is just maybe a natural log or something. It doesn't do very much. But with this, uh, with this terminology, uh, you can get, I mean, it becomes, for certain things, it becomes more natural. Uh, well, easy to write down. It's, of course, equivalent. So if you have, for instance, if you have L1, L2, these are line bundles on x. And if I have phi1, phi2, say these are metrics on L1, L2. And if I have, say, I don't know, R1, R2, and z, then I can say that I can do R1, phi1, plus R2, V2 is a metric on R1, L1, plus R2, L2. Okay. That's one thing. And then uh, 
I also want to do, I want to identify, say, matrix on the trivial line model. So OX, where the just functions on X. Right. So I'll just evaluate at just a section kind of one. Right. <coughs> okay. So I should say, I mean, so this may be not completely standard, but it's very useful. Uh, so, so, so these, so these the these kind of functions. I mean, just a line model is essentially. I mean, a section of a line model is almost like a function on the underlying variety. Uh, in the same way, a metric is essentially the same thing as a function. So, a functions uh, these phi. So, I mean, sometimes these are sometimes called. Weights. I mean, the weights of the metric. Um, okay. All right. Okay. Now we have curvature of metrics. So I mean, you have the uh, Kähler metrics and metrics on various line models, and of course there there's some connections between them. So if I have, um, suppose, so suppose in this terminology I have phi is equal to some, well, so far I only looked at smooth metrics, but on L. Um, so if I have such a thing, I'm going to define, with a slight abuse of notation, I'm going to define DDC of phi to be equal to, well, minus i over pi. So this also defines some version of DC here, but let me, I'm not going to worry too much about the normalizations, but this is what I want. And then I do D, D bar, um, and then what I do is I take log and, and I evaluate any section like this. So this is, so S, so S is some local non-vanishing, I mean nowhere vanishing section. Of L, right? So this doesn't depend on the choice of section because if any other section would be just the same as S times F, where F is holomorphic, and then you get an extra term which is killed by DD bar. Okay, but so it's so it's convenient terminology. But I should maybe say uh, just note here that so this with this terminology DDC phi is not. Exact in general, right? In fact, this DDC phi actually belongs to. It's a it's a positive one. It's a one one form, which is in the Chern class of of L. Right. So, okay. And you say that phi is positive if, well, this DDC phi is strictly positive like this. So which just means that the same thing as, well, DDC phi then is a, is a Kähler form. Sorry? Yes, yeah, sorry, yes, holomorphic section, yes. Yes. Thanks. OK. Then we have one more thing. So this is kind of metrics on various line models. Um, but this canonical bundle is especially important. And metrics on canonical bundles 
on the metrics on the canonical bundle have kind of a special role. All right, so let me write this somewhere else. Um, so if I have, so it turns out that metric, so this will be, is kind of implicitly used a lot. And it's, it's the fact that there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between metrics in this sense on the canonical bundle and volume forms on X as, as say like a Riemannian manifold, right? So there is a, So if I have metrics on kx, so this is a so one-to-one -one correspondence between, say, um, volume forms, by which I mean kind of just a smooth positive measures on x. So this is essentially standard, but let me, so in my terminology, I want to define this as kind of e to the 2 psi. Okay, so if I have a metric on kx, so I mean, why, what is this thing? So this is defined to be, what I do is I, um, whenever I have, I mean, sections of kx, holomorphic sections are uh, holomorphic n forms. So I take such a guy, and then I divide it by the norm of um, psi squared, right? Um, so where, so here is, right, so here is, if a eta is a, it's a holomorphic n form, so, and this eta squared is like, essentially just eta, which eta bar, except that I might norm, I want to normalize it to really get a, Form. So like maybe I don't i to the n squared, and well, depending on your taste, you might take, divide by two to the n or not. Anyway, and then you normalize by this number, and then it doesn't depend on eta. So this is kind of a local. All right. And then in the other direction, just notation-wise, I'm going to say that if I have a dv here, so some kind of volume form, I just going to write this. I mean, with this notation, this is like one half log dv. Or So that's quite useful. And then it leads to Ricci curvature, which I'll present in a slightly different way than in the previous talk, but it's equivalent, but it's very much adapted to this kind of specialized situation. Of course, Ricci curvature comes more generally in Riemannian geometry. Um, So it's kind of a tailor-made definition. So if I have omega, which is a Kähler form on x, so of course I can take omega to the n. And I might want to normalize, divide this by n factorial or whatever. Um, but let me just do it like this. So this is a, um, I mean, this is one of these volume forms. I mean, it's a smooth positive measure. So I can take, well, if I take one half log in this terminology, omega to the n, then this is a metric on kx. And then if I do a negative sign with this, this is a metric on minus kx, right? So then I get, and I define the Ricci curvature. I mean, so again, it's, it's not so much, I mean, it's really is a, it's a definition, but uh, of course it ties in with uh, more general situations, at least up to normalization. So this would be DDC of then maybe minus the 1 half log omega to the n. Okay, so this is something that lies in 
C1x, which is um, C1 on minus Kx. Okay? You're given a Kähler form. In some cohomology class, you get a new form in a closed form in the in this uh, C1 of x. Right. So as was as uh, Bingham already talked about, you have the. So let me not say more about the history here, because it was already done. Uh, right. So this is. I mean, it's not just Yao, but I guess after all, Yao is maybe the. If I have to name one person, I'll do that. Uh, so for any, if I fix any Kähler form. Um, So let me call this omega 0 uh, on x. Then the map taking, so the, the map from Kähler forms, so taking omega cohomologous to omega 0 to, um, I guess, closed 1, 1 forms in C1 of x. So this is the map that takes omega to Ricci omega. So this is, I mean, the main point is surjective, but it's bijective. Okay. Okay. So now, I mean, the, well, again, I'll continue. So it'll be very close to what, close to the last talk, but uh, that's, I think that's okay. So I'll say something about Kähler-Einstein metrics. And then I'll finish by talking about the generations a little bit. Then we'll okay. All right. So Kähler-Einstein metrics are ones that are kind of where the, where the Kähler form is related to the Ricci form. They're proportional. Right. So you say that it's the same. So a Kähler metric omega on x is a, so let me just the Kähler-Einstein metric if, uh, well, so if it's Ricci omega is proportional to omega. Right. And again, as was observed, so I mean, after scaling, if I multiply omega by positive constant, the Ricci doesn't change. Uh, so I can take, I can assume that lambda is either 0 or plus minus 1, right? And then you have the three cases. So I'm just going to repeat essentially what was said before, but anyway. So this is the main case for us. So this is when, so Ricci is 0. So this is kind of the Ricci, the Ricci flat metric. Um, so Yao's, so of course this, this is only possible if um, this implies that C1 of x is 0, which I guess is a weaker condition than what I called Kalabi Yao, but let's ignore that. But it's essentially the same. In any case, Yao's theorem implies that um, any well, for an, any Kähler class contains unique Ricci flat represented. So for every omega 0 um, Kähler, there exists a unique omega uh, cohomologous to omega 0 such that this is 0. All right, so let me briefly mention the other two cases. So 
So when you have a positive and negative curvature, so this is when lambda is, which one do I want to do? Say minus 1. So this is Ricci omega equal to minus omega. So this implies that this is only possible if um, C1x is negative. So this means that x is canonically polarized. And once, once it is, then well, the theorem by Yao, or maybe Aubin Yao, implies that um, such a, I mean, omega exists, right? So, and is unique, such a thing, in that case. So canonically polarized was that kx, the canonical bundle is, is ample. Right? Is ample, so there are, lots sec there are enough sections, so it's a multiple, so the canonical bundle gives you embedding into a projective space. Okay. And then finally, this uh, lambda is plus 1, so then you want Ricci omega equal to omega. And this is only part, this implies that x is Fano. So kx is minus kx is ample. Um, but that's not enough, and as was discussed. So, well, it's a theorem. There's a lot to say about this, but uh, let me at least say that Chen Donaldson Sun, many other people dimensioned. Um, implies that if this, in this case, if you're a Fano, then omega exists. Such a Keller-Einstein metric exists if and only if x has some stability condition. I guess it's what they prove is exactly kx is k polystable, which I'm not going to define. Okay. Um, all right. Let me also say that instead of looking in, in the case, in the, at least in the last two cases, or actually in all cases, I mean, so, so you can instead of, so in, um, say in the case lambda equal to plus minus 1, you can instead So instead of looking for Kähler metrics, I can look for uh, metrics on the canonical bundle with some good property. So, so if one of metrics psi, I mean, it's not that it really helps, but it's a different way of formulating it. So, so I guess here plus minus. Um, well, I hope this uh, right. Let's see, it's probably minus plus, but anyway, such that. In any case, but so you can you can look for this, right? So whenever I, I have when I have a metric on a canonical bundle, there are two ways of getting a volume form. So on the one hand, I can take the curvature. That's a one-one form. It's a Kähler form. I can take its nth power, and then so I can say that this. And then on the other hand, I can have this bijection between metrics on the canonical bundle and. Uh, <coughs> And a volume form, so I can write like this, and I think so. This is now, uh, I guess, plus minus, here. So, depending on where I am. Right? So, so this this is kind of as volume forms on on, uh, on X. I mean, it's equivalent. Right? It's not that it's easier to solve that, but it's a different interpretation. And maybe as a similar remark, on the other hand, in the Calabi-Yau case, uh, well, maybe I'll get to that later, actually. Let me know. Uh, I mean, in the Calabi-Yau case, I can also relate somehow the Ricci flat metric to the to a volume form, but in a kind of trivial way. Okay. All right. So now let me finally go to.
I just wanted to set up this terminology to kind of to be able to talk a bit precisely about what I want to look at. Right. So here I have a, so it's a map x from, from d star. So this is a map pi. So this is supposed to be a smooth, uh, smooth and projective. And let me, I want this to kind of be meromorphic at, at the origin, right? So I mean, I just explicitly, what does this mean? I'm not assuming anything about the fibers right now. So I mean, just, you can think of this explicitly. So I mean, you, you basically have x sitting inside some pn cross d star like this. And then you just have the projection. So d star. So this is just cut out by, by some suitable homogeneous polynomials. And then I'm assuming that the coefficients are then holomorphic on d star, but meromorphic at 0. So that's the kind of situation I want to look at, um, right? So I want to, in princ principle, look at two possible cases, but I'm quickly just going to work with one of them. But in principle, there are two interesting ones. Go like that. Um, so the relative, well, so there's a canonical bundle. But in this situa situation, I have the relative <coughs> canonical bundle. So this is the one that has the good property that if I restrict it to xt, this is just the canonical bundle on xt. So it's kind of set up to, for that. Okay. And I'm going to focus on, so I I'll look at two cases. The first is when this kx over d star is trivial. So this, this is kind of the Calabiao case. And in the second case, uh, um, this, I want this to be, say, relatively ample. So it's ample when I restrict it to xt. Well, in, third, in principle, it's the third case when you have fauna or whatever, but uh, I think that's not really so reasonable. Uh, and let me focus and just say something about the first case. So the first case, uh, so, in the, so in the first case, so then you also fix L. So this is a line bundle on X, which I am assume is relatively ample. So this just means that L restricted to kind of xt is ample. I mean, I didn't say xt is the fiber over t there. Over something else. OK? So this, if I have that, then by, uh, not by about, by Yao, means that there exists a unique, um, right? There's a unique omega 2 uh, inside. Um, C1LT, which is Ricci flat. So this gives rise to the whole yoga here. So I mean, you, you have that, and that gives rise to, in particular, a you get a metric space, just xt dt. You also get a volume form, which which should be, say, omega t to the n or something on x. And for 2, it's kind of, well, let me just, since I'm kind of running out of time here, so it's basically similar. Um, so then the question I would like to address, I mean, the, the, perhaps the more interesting question is what happens kind of in a metric limit. So, the, so here's kind of the question. So what can be said about? D 
these objects. Right. So uh, what I mean, these objects. So, I mean, so you get, so if you're, these are Kalabiao, you get some kind of metric space. And then it turns out that, well, there is a notion of gromov hausdorff convergence. So you, you can put on a conjecture what, that these would converge in some gromov hausdorff sense. And uh, so that's very interesting and not so much is known about it. And then I'll talk more about the case of what you can say about the convergence of these volume forms, uh, which is easier to study, at least in this, at least in this case. Uh, but you need to, what you need to make sense of the statement, what, what the limit measure would be. All right, but we'll kind of take off from here next time, so I'll stop here. Thank you very much. Other questions, comments?